Hello, in this Excel tutorial video for Chem 1B, we'll be working up the last part of Experiment 16 using the calibration curve to determine the, the key thermodynamic values we were asked to calculate. So if you recall last time, we completed the calibration curve, and we're going to go ahead and use that now in our last step. There's a number of suggested conversions in your lab book. I use slightly different ones in this video, but we're going to sort of walk through how we can do these stoichiometric calculations in Excel. We'll end up with some data that we're going to plot, calculate a best fit line, and then our thermodynamic values. For starters, the absorbance was equal to the minus log of the percent T. Recall that if the percent is in the cell, it's displaying it as a decimal, and you can, or thinking of it as a decimal, you can use it directly. If it is displaying just as 29.1, then you would need to divide that value by 100. We can use this value, this is our, our unknown Y, and the calibration data from the previous sheet. Now to get to the previous sheet while I'm typing in the formula, I click on the tab for the other sheet, and I wanted to subtract the intercept, I click on that cell. You'll notice it's still referring to the equation we used before, but now there's a little calibration exclamation point that refers to that sheet. And I'm going to hit F4 to make that an absolute reference, close parentheses, and divide by the slope. So X is equal to Y minus B over M. Okay. So that was the, the second step. That gave me the concentration of I3 minus in that tube that you put in the spectrophotometer. But we need to know the I3 minus concentration in the sample. And this is a dilution calculation again. Now some of the data that I had the students record and they've entered here is 5 milliliters of sample each time. And the total volume, once they added their other reagents, the I minus and the HCl, is a total of 13 milliliters. So in this case, we take the concentration times the diluted volume, and that's going to be an absolute cell reference, and we divide by the volume of sample. And this is essentially going backwards in a dilution to what the concentrated value was before we did the dilution. Okay, and reality check quickly. It's more concentrated than it was in the dilute sample, so that's a good sign that we did the calculation right. Now, if you recall the, the reaction stoichiometry, for each IO3 minus that we have, when we added the I minus to it, there was a 3 to 1 reaction stoichiometry. Given we're talking about the same volume, now, as we convert moles of I3- minus to what the original concentration of IO3- minus is, it's going to be equal to that I3- minus divided by 3. And if you write out the stoichiometric calculation, you'll see where that 3 comes from. But for each IO3- minus, we get 3I-, minus, and the concentration of IO3- minus is calculated there. We have another reaction stoichiometry step here. When the barium iodate solid dissociates, you get one barium for two iodates. So the concentration of barium, assuming we haven't added any iodate or barium separately, the concentration of barium has to be the same as that iodate concentration divided by two. And I can calculate KSP as equal to the barium concentration times the iodate concentration squared. If you're not sure where that squared comes from, go ahead and write out the solubility product constant expression. Okay, So that's all the stoichiometry and the, the quick calculations I needed to do. To get so I had a linear plot, if you, if you look at the thermodynamic equations we've been asked to use, we want to plot the natural log of the equilibrium constant versus 1 over t. So if to calculate 1 over t, it's equal to 1 divided by the temperature. But remember, the temperature needs to be in Kelvin, and we've recorded it in Celsius. So we take Celsius, and we add 273.15 to it. And there's our inverse Kelvin temperature scale. The natural log function in Excel is ln, open parentheses, and stick in what you want to take the log of. Now, we could use the LOG function, the base 10 log. 
If you use the base 10 log, you need to include that 2.3 correction factor. I'm going to use the natural log, so I don't need to include that correction factor. And there's my natural log. I'm going to do a regression analysis again, is equal to slope. My y's are the natural log. My x's are the inverse temperature. Now note, I can do horizontal things. We've always used columns before, but in this case, my data is in rows, and that's just fine. Intercept, y's, and x's. Just like it was convenient when we got to plotting to have the x data in the first column and the y data after it, it's the same thing. x data in the first row, y data after it just makes the the calculations run a little easier as far as using the, the chart wizard. The fit is calculated the same way as equal to m, the slope, as an absolute reference, times x. Don't make the mistake of using your lin k value, that's your y data, plus the intercept as an absolute reference. Okay. I'm going to go ahead and plot this data now. I'm going to select the range of data I want to plot, go to the chart wizard, XY scatter, looks more or less appropriate. On the titles, I'm going to call this my thermodynamic calculations. The x-axis was 1 over t. The y-axis was natural log of k. I'm going to skip grid lines and the legend. Move this over a little bit so we can see what we're doing. Now, a couple things. Get rid of the gray. I don't much care for the gray. I'm going to take my fit line, format data series, get rid of the data points so I get a, a line in my fit. The last thing I want to do is I want to move this axis. I don't like it being at the top. I t talked to you before about using a right click to open the format axis. You can also just double click on the axis. And there's an option down here for the value x-axis crosses at. Right now it's at the top. I want it at minus 21 so it's at the bottom. And there I go and I get a plot I'm a little more comfortable with. So that looks okay. It's the, the, these two points are a little off the line, but on the whole for experimental data in 1B, this is a, a good plot. The next step is to calculate my H and S values. I've gone ahead and in my constants table, I've entered R as 0 .008314. Now that would be in units of kilojoules per mole Kelvin. Um, the 8.314 is joules per mole Kelvin. You can use either one, you just have to keep track of it and make sure your units are the same. So, <clears throat> using the uh, equation, which you can find at the about halfway down on page 207 in the lab book for um, the Spring 09 version, you'll see that the, natu the natural log of, of the equilibrium constant is equal to minus delta H over R. So equals, <coughs> going backwards, the H is equal to minus R times the slope. And that gives me a delta H of 52.3 kilojoules Per mole. Okay. And S we're going to calculate in a similar fashion, except this time there's no minus. This is equal to, <coughs> so the intercept was equal to S over R, so S is equal to R times the intercept. And you'll notice this number is a lot smaller. That's not uncommon, but we'll go ahead and enter this as kilojoules per mole. And then the last step was to calculate G. And G is equal to delta H minus T in Kelvin 
times delta s. Notice where I've used the absolute cell references. I drag it across. 